today's conversation, as I just mentioned to today's guest, they made me reflect a bit as I was preparing because I'm always trying to be in, in the now and trying to be present. And, and actually, that's, that's quite a hard toll when you're fighting with your mind. I know a lot of leaders out there are hit with a lot of challenges today. And we're going to be talking a bit about today how you actually might be able to, to manage some of these thoughts better and actually get more mindful, as you say. But we, it's not mindfulness is per se. It's actually also how you actually can measure it. And for that, I have a great guest for you today. I have Reiner, who has experienced not being mindful himself, but he's also found a way to manage that. And now he's found a program that helps other leaders. So welcome to the show, Reiner. It's absolutely a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, thanks, Michael, for having me on the show today. Looking forward to our discussion. And I think we need to start with the origin story, Reiner, because very interesting when you go on your website, when we've been talking before, you went on a journey yourself. You were in a, in a quite high performance environment. So let's start there and give the, the audience a bit of an overview on, on the journey you were, where you actually started getting very interested in what mindful practices can do for you as a leader. Yeah, sure. I mean, if you look at my background and look me up on LinkedIn or on the back, You'll see that I've been in technology for many decades. In the mid nineties, I moved to the Silicon Valley and had a lot of fun starting my career in tech. And it was very fast paced. It was a lot of innovation going on. Internet was just starting and a lot of excitement. And yeah, of course, uh, a lot of work hours that I put in, but not just me. I mean, everyone working there usually was putting in these hours. It's completely normal. And yeah, those things were progressing nicely. I've been researched later at Yahoo and I moved into tech leadership role. And of course the, the responsibility was growing more and more responsibility, more deliverables and pace was basically going up more and more. And so at some point I was never the like stressed type of guy, but it is basically this idea of mental exhaustion at some point hit me. And I, of course, I didn't know what it, what it was. I just felt there's less energy. You want to somehow still do more, but you couldn't. So you were somehow on this, this plateau where you basically, there were left all of the sounds have limits. And so oh, what's going on? And I had no clue about uh, mindfulness, stress management, and all that stuff. I was just working on focusing on my work. And there, of course, I did a lot of work. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was also teaching at some point at the university in California, Santa Cruz, and pretty much commuting back between Santa Cruz, the Silicon Valley, and, and back to my home place. And so at the end. The, the whole stress thing got me and I think I would call it now mental exhaustion. It was not a burnout. It was like this stage that you reached prior to the burnout. Mm. And so, so I was, and of course I didn't even know that I had no idea about the terminology and I learned all that stuff later, but I had this then moment of epiphany when I woke up in the middle of the night. I don't know, 3 a.m. or whatever time it was. And basically I felt I'm kind of dying, right? There's some heart attack, all those symptoms. And I said, what, what is this? I got scared. And then I was basically the, the, they came by emergency unit and then they measured everything. And then they straight away put me, basically drove me into the hospital. And this was the critical phase when I was in that, in the, during this drive, right? I, all of a sudden stepped a little bit back and I got into a very calm state of mind. I was literally observing myself and all of a sudden things, what the worries before they all disappeared, right? Everything was gone and I was just literally looking at myself somehow. This was really a moment I, it was so peaceful and calm and say, oh, wow, this is cool. And then 
when I arrived in the hospital, of course, I did all these tests. And I said, oh, yeah, all fine. You probably have too much stress or anxiety. Here, here are some pills. Take them. And I, they did a little bit more of investigation. And then they released me the next morning. So this was the, the part where, where I realized, okay, I have to change something. It's not, this was like the warning sign, really a tough one. I said, yeah, I have, I have to change something. But of course, what do I do now? Right. And then Yahoo offered at that point this mindfulness based stress reduction class, eight weeks. MBSR is a standard global program, which I learned about. And they recommended it and said, here, take this, go there once a week. And you learn some breathing techniques, mindfulness exercises, and so on. A little bit of meditation. And I said, yeah, sure, why not? At that point, I'll try everything. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I did it, and it worked very well. I was surprised. And I got, again, when I got more and more into this, into very deep states of meditation, that it's hard to describe even what happened there. But they were so profound. I said, oh, there is, there is something to this. And I still remember that feeling that I had during this drive to the hospital. There was this really calm and peaceful state of mind. But normally it was the opposite. During my day, there is the busy mind, there's this increased thought activity. You're always thinking, planning, rehashing the past. And even in the evening, you come home from work, you're still thinking about stuff. Then you wake up in the middle of the night and still thinking, whatever. It's, it's terrible, right? So this was my default state. But once I, I started exploring mindfulness, I quickly felt things were improving. There was something from a subjective point of view. I could see the benefits. And then the questions then immediately I had, oh, this is cool. Now I could work more. <laughs> but that wasn't the purpose, right? The purpose was now think, think a little bit better in terms of how you can now better balance your life. How can you take some of these learnings also and apply them to the work context? That was the second one. And most importantly, what already intrigued me at that point was, as I'm a scientist, I like to see some data and numbers. And this all this mindfulness stuff, how is it working? How do I know it's actually real? How do I, how can I measure this? Right. And so those were questions that popped up that I wanted to investigate and explore, which I did over the next decade, basically. And Ryder, you mentioned these like warning signs, like if you can talk a bit about the stages that coming up to what you call mentally exhausted and then burnout comes, because we always talk about burnout or stress. That's the typical two words I've definitely heard. I never heard that mental exhaustedness. And I can actually, when I look back and reflect on that. That's definitely hop happened off. I never had the warning sign of having going into hospital personally, but I definitely know of people that has ended there and they thought they were in principle dying, as you just mentioned, the same kind of term. Can you talk a bit about like those faces and what is it that, you know, you should be starting looking out for in, on that journey? Yeah, sure. They are different from person to person, but usually it starts with that you can't sleep that well anymore, that you're kind of tense, you feel more and more tension coming up, your busy mind, busy mind is increasing, more and more thought activity. But it could also be more on the worrying side, negativity creeping in, self-doubt. And yeah, that sometimes could be like an imposter syndrome. Am I really the, the right person here? Can I even get this done? You start doubting yourself, your capabilities. So these are all the forms of leading towards this because they're all the negativity and the high thought activity. They lead to this mental exhaustion state. And then uh, the symptoms, they get more and more into the body. As I said, sleep is one effect, uh, but then there's other things that you can look out for where the day actually you get sick, right? And they could be, they could, they can be more minor forums. It could be go to your physical and then they, they test your, let's say, blood pressure and then they see it's elevated a little bit. So they, they can see that basically some of the biomarkers in the body could be affected. Mm. And, and so those, this is when it starts affecting the body. That is already at the, at the stage where ideally you don't want to even get there. 
<laughs> yeah. But most people get there, and this was exactly the case for me. I already had some of these symptoms. Of course, not all of them you can measure if you don't go to the doctor and do some lab work, but some of them you can feel for sure. Um, some people feel anxiety. They, feel, they, they get so-called anxiety attacks. If you never had one, then look out when you get the first. You know what I'm talking about then. Mm -hmm. It's not pleasant, these things. It's not pleasant. And the when you get into this, that means you're already very far advanced here in this state toward mental exhaustion. You're actually already, already in there full speed. And then if you don't, if you still keep ignoring them, so, oh yeah, that's how it's supposed to be. I work a lot. That's how it's supposed to be. No, it's not supposed to be like this. This is, this is basically one of those thoughts that you're telling yourself that if you're working in a high pressure situation, it has to be like this. Yeah. But that's not the case, right? Yeah. It's just something that you're not taking properly care of your mind and your body. And if you still keep ignoring the stuff, things get worse. Eventually the burnout is then a state when pretty much everything is depleted. It's a clinical state. It can be validated with certain biomarkers as well. But then at the end of the day, not much is going on even anymore. Like even the, even I've seen people with burnouts, right? And they came to me mm. and, and basically asked for some training, coaching and support, whatever. But usually I can't help them at that stage because the body is in, in such a poor state and the mind as well that uh, these people need therapy for, first. So that under the supervision of an experienced doctor and that is something it takes time and getting out of this. People change quite a bit after such an experience and it can take months, sometimes years for them to get back to normal state. So yeah. I think the short thing is you don't want to get there. Trust me on this. <laughs> yeah. and, and if you feel first signs in the body uh, already, if you become aware of them, then this is uh, basically should be the wake up call now. But then the question is, what do you do? Right. And what can you, what can you do? And this was basically over the years, I spent many, many years on this topic, exploring all kinds of um, mindfulness techniques, neuroscience. I got deep into this neurofeedback. I mm. got into, and of course, into biohacking, the science of epigenetics. So because I realized it's, there is three pillars awareness, the mind, mind operating system or the software of the mind running here. And then there is the hardware, which is the body, the brain, right? And all of them, they need to, we have to take proper care, but we have to have the knowledge and the information on how to do this. And unfortunately, nobody is teaching that stuff in school. Uh, I would argue that uh, kids in kindergarten would need to learn about important things like how to optimize their vitamin D levels, how to meditate, right? And how to basically start debugging the mind. So those are basic skills that people should learn when they're young. <laughs> and so that when they get older, they, they can rely on them. They can use them and they can then take these techniques to manage their life basically and the career in a much more conscious and effective way. And it's super interesting as you talk through those stages. I've actually heard people recently, as I said to you, when we started, before we started recording as well, I talked with some leaders, so where they are, you know, how mindful they felt. And they were talking about the sleep symptoms, you know, the tension kind of thing, you know, the, the patient level disappears with people they're normally quite patient with all their team members or their family or whatever it is. So it's really, really interesting. I think that really, really valuable for people to understand. They get that awareness. Actually, it's now that I need to act. I can't wait. I need to act now. I need to invest now not to get to, you know, the, the alternative thing you said, the burnout where you don't want to end because that the consequence of that, it's huge, huge, huge. And it's very difficult to, to get back from. So, so, so the program you created then from all that experience, Ryan, I was really, really super interested. I just wanted to jump into the phases you created, you know, the mindful leader program. Can you talk a bit about that program, how you're taking you both, you both a scientific, but also, you know, a very spiritual approach to creating that program. And then you also talk about the measurements, how that fit in there and, you know, and how, how did you actually get to the idea from, you know, I'm in tech now, so now I'm going to be running you know, a mindful leader program. 
Yeah, so there looks like there's multiple questions buried in yeah. here. After a decade and probably more than 10,000 10, hours diving into these different topics, at some point you get really good at this. And then I decided at some point uh, a few years ago that uh, I wanted to shift in my career since I've been, I felt like I've been through all the different stations around tech leadership. That's great. Let's do something new. And this is when I founded the Mindful Leader because I wanted to use these learnings and teach others, help them, mentor them, coach them. So on how they can take advantage of those things to become a better person, become a better leader and yeah, increase their level of well-being and just get their mind in a better state, which is so profound if you know how mm. to do it. And initially I was working more as an executive coach, leadership topics with experienced executive tech leaders, but also business leaders. And when I was working with them, these typical topics that I mentioned before, right? The, the busy mind, the stress situations, negativity, worry, self-doubt, all the good stuff, which I summarized as this term, the monkey mind, right? It's the state of this little monkey in your mind bouncing around. It's not something I made up. It's been around in literature for thousands of years, but the monkey mind is really what I to figure it out, this is the source of all the problems. And then I figured, well, how can you tame the monkey mind? How can you do it? Because people are always asking, how can you do this? I need this now, tomorrow, or even better today. How can I tame the monkey mind? Or how can I get out of this stressful mode, stop the busy mind? And how do I know it's actually working? <laughs> and so that was the, that was the question. And so I thought, well, for me. I know how to do it. How can I teach others in a very structured way? And this, when this idea came, what I now refer to the high performance mind, the high performance mindset, which is a combination of increased level of awareness an upgraded mind OS, mind operating system, and an upgraded body, putting these three things together. And that is what I refer to as the high performance mindset. And so then I created this program because for me to scale and reach many people here on this planet was to create the program. And as I'm a techie structured guy, right? I like systems. I like numbers I mentioned before. Let's make this executable and make this use an agile approach. Same that we use for develop software. Let's do like weekly sprints, boom, boom, boom. And let's work in parallel on these three threads of execution, awareness, mind, and body. Mm. And for every, every week, there is a focus topic that it's not getting too much. People usually have a lot of workload. So to be able to participate in a training like this, it has to be still uh, doable from a time commitment. So I figured, well, someone 15 minutes, 20 minutes, max a day that is someone can do this. If they really want to see results, there is no free lunch here. No. And so if they, they are able to put in these 15 minutes every day, Monday to Friday, do a little bit of reflection and a few of the exercises, then that could work. And the focus was teach them the knowledge so that they have the knowledge. But then it was the more important part was how to operationalize that knowledge into your own life, because we're all different. We have different schedules and stuff going on and we need to kick this like I give them a menu, right? Here's all these items that you can do. Let's pick a few, try out. And then as it's agile, right? And we need to also know where we are in terms of baseline. We need to do measurements. And so it was very clear. And I developed this already years ago because I wanted for myself to see how I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. And so you need, you need KPIs for awareness. You need KPIs for the mind and you need KPIs for the body. The body usually is the easier one because there's biomarkers in biohacking community, functional medicine. It's very clear. There's blood work, there's some laboratory tests that you can do. So that is the, I would say still complex, but it's the easier part for the mind. It's a little bit more tricky and in Italy, it was very fuzzy, right? So what is a mind KPI? What is awareness KPI? So. I kept investigating and then 
eventually it arrived at many of these KPIs, started baselining them, tried different interventions. Let's, let's improve here. Is it working? No, not really. Let's try something else. And so that is the whole approach where in the high performance mind program, I give people all these different options and here, 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 and here. And I teach them how to set up a baseline, how to basically do the tracking. And then they can figure out, is it working for them or not? And if it's working, do more. If not, iterate, pivot, do something else. Right? And that is, the, I think, the success of the program is that there is real transformation happening because either these KPIs are going up for you. And that's one thing that you see, okay, great, on my spreadsheet, I see there's a, there's a, a lift here in some of these KPIs. But this is actually stuff you feel, right? It's not just... KPIs, but you actually feel that you feel breakthroughs happening in your life. And this is how the correlation is there that this actually has an impact that people went through this program. They basically had all kinds of breakthroughs, right? It's of course also different from person to person, what kind of breakthroughs they, they achieve, but it's all good stuff. And that's why, of course, when I created the program two years ago and then I had a pilot, we're iterating, people got in there, tried it out, worked well. Some, I remember at the beginning, complaint is a little bit too fast paced. <laughs> so I, since I'm used to this, when I was studying in the universities and basically there is always, you know, there, there's these lectures, three months, it's like boom, boom, boom. And here it's kind of similar. So I'm used to this pace, but I, I then also realized, let's keep it a little bit more relaxed. And so the program was evolving and still there's a lot of work to be done. It's a training. And I started offer, offering different versions, like where you can use my learning platform, the mindfultechleaders.com. And I think we can probably put notes then in the show notes there on links to all these things. But basically the platform allows people to work through this on their own. They can do a micro learning approach, but then those who say, I want more accountability. There's also a coaching addition, premium coaching that they can take advantage of. And so that is the good thing that whatever taste there is, they can pick different options there. And the program was evolving. And so for now it's well-rounded, I would say it of course still iterates, but it's like this, think about it, this tooling. So what you learn is the basic tooling to really thrive in this fast-paced environment today, whether it is in tech or in a different industry, I think it's always very similar that nowadays there's more and more information to absorb, there is more and more deadlines. And I think this is the tool set to basically prepare you for those challenges because the challenges around you are not going to change, but the way you interpret them and react to them, this is where the mind comes in. Right, this will be upgraded. So you can be in this turmoil at work where other people get stressed, but you pretty much you're in a calm state because you're connected to the present moment, right? And so you can at the end of the day make better quality decisions, you're you're less stressed, and people sense this, and this improves the quality of whatever work you do. And I think I got around all the questions. I was thinking also, I just threw like four questions at you because I got really excited about athlete. And there's also very like, very, there's some very stoic philosophy around actually preparing yourself for a situation, not waiting till the situation happens, but actually, you know, accepting that actually I need some tools for my mind because we will all be listening to what you're saying and knowing that yeah, your mind is running 600 kilometers an hour a day solving problems, solving strategies, solving family things, planning, you know, whatever it is. And that's actually where it comes from and actually how you actually can take one thing at a time and be present with also the Stoics, which I'm a very big fan of, so the audience know that and Stoic philosophy. But one thing I was thinking about, if you had to define, you know, mindful leadership, what is it that, that happens when you get you really to grips, you go on the, your program, you get to grips, you get the tools, you have, you have awareness, you have control of the mind and the body is in a great thing. What kind of, how does it feel? Oh, <laughs> it feels great. <laughs> so you get, I mean, this is, this is so different. I mean, once you're actually in this calm state of mind and this 
in this ultra focus stay, you can stay in this uh, flow state for hours or days, basically, right? It's amazing stuff. I mean, uh, once you're in there, then you think back in these old days, you say, oh my goodness, how could I even live in this, in this old version of myself? But you have to first reach the state, so then you can make the comparison. Before that, you think in your misery of the current state, where all this garbage of the mind happens and all the stress comes out and suffering at the end. Then you think this is actually the normal state, and you think about this is oh yeah, this is this is what it is, right? Why why right? Why would I change it? It is or maybe I can't even change it. It's the default. It's how it is. So, but once you do this transformation and the transformation is happening, if you basically keep measuring on these KPIs, the KPIs get you there. It's like this vehicle, this, this mechanism that gets you into the state. And once you reach a certain state, level of present awareness, level of consciousness, you can pretty much at that point, the tracking is, is less work. You can stop tracking some of the stuff. Of course, some things you still want to track, even that in that stage, but life is uh, quite different from here. And so the quality of life is quite different. And then, of course, everything is affected on personal level and work level. So that's why leadership, mindful leadership, mindfulness, mindful leadership is just a fancy term. I mean, it means mm -hmm. being in mind, it means, and I actually introduced it many years ago because I wanted to have something that I can attach to leadership, what I was up, what I was after was some new form of leadership, a more conscious form of leadership. And then there were all kinds of other terms coming in, selfless leadership, servant leadership was investigated. So there's all these different types, but leadership, mindful leadership at the end, is just means that you're more conscious, whatever you're doing and that the uh, mm. leadership itself is an application of what you build as a foundation. So think about the high performance mind training upgrades your awareness, mind and body to a certain level. It increases your capabilities on all fronts and all aspects. And now you have all these cool improved uh, qualities and then you leadership is just an application of what you can do with them. Mm -hmm. you can, but you can do other things as well. Let's say you want to do gardening as an example and create a, a nice garden in your backyard, that would be another application that you can use with a high-performance mind, right? So the high-performance mind is a combination of awareness, mind and body, everything in really top shape. They have lots of energy, you're ultra resilient, right? And you can just get stuff done, but you're very calm, but you can from this calm focus a kind of state you can switch into execution mode on demand. This is called mental flexibility or mental agility, but you can also go back into this, turn your mind off within a second, right? It's, it's just you come home, click switch, and then you're basically in the, in the home mode. And if you want to switch back, you do it, right? So this is like the superpowers in quotes that you now have at your disposal with an upgraded mind and body. And what you do with it is up to you. If you want to use it for leadership, if you, if you're an engineer, you want to use it for programming, if you, or as I just said, if you just want to do uh, some gardening or you want to learn how to prepare some really cool, cool, healthy meals, then this is all options on the application level. And this is really interesting. You talk about, you talk about a garden, which is really much what leadership is about. This, you're know, planting seeds and you're maintaining water and making sure it's all organized and actually this in the way it has to be to get the business model working, you know, and a lot of organizational theory builds on this garden mythology. And we had Ari on the show recently that's going to talk a bit about the organizational ecosystem and the importance of, you know, feeding the soil in, in, in the right way. So it's very much in that. So, so what, let me take it on a team level. What have you seen? Have you seen any, you know, really transformation where leaders has gone on this journey where you have helped them or you, you've seen others doing it where they really see that impact move down into their team as well? Because I think really, you know, you want to be in a high performance state yourself and then you want to, as a leader, you want to transist that into your team so you get the best out of them in principle. Yeah, sure. 
I mean, the general idea always is it's very popular building a high performance culture at work and there's different frameworks out there and different approaches, uh, but at the end of the day, this is what companies try to achieve high performance. And you can see how well the high performance mindset is the same terminology. It tells you that uh, you optimize yourself first, and then there's a ripple effect to the teams. Mm. The teams sense if you are actually have a high performance mind, if you have presence, if you're, or if your mind is stuck in a monkey mind state, the busy mind state, the stress state, people can sense this. The team senses this, right? So they see if this is a leader who has a high performance mindset, or is this a leader who is basically so stressed out and erratic and, and just doing poor decisions all the time. So, and then of course you, I mean, you can already guess it if, if such a leader was not a high performance mindset, right? Do you think at the end of the day that in modern organizations, when you try to create a new workplace and you have a leader like this, that the team actually wants to follow that leader? Probably not, right? And then no. people, people leave. They have choices and options. They want to probably work. I mean, they, they don't may not know the term mind for leader or high performance mind, whatever. But they look at the leader and then they sense, is there a sufficient level of presence? And when they sense that is the case, there is also building up, it builds up trust and confidence. And so you have an impact on the teams. And then of course you can measure the impact as well. This is how as a leader you have to become creative. So I worked with different leaders and, and on KPIs for the organizations and effectiveness of the teams, engagements of the teams all the different things you can, you can also make this trackable and different creative approaches. And then you, then you can see what the impact is. And several companies did this also on a larger scale, like SAP, they did a study as an example on, yeah. on their workforce, the impact on mindfulness. This was many years ago, six, seven years or so, at least. And they were measuring, measuring like getting people through a simple mindfulness program over a few weeks and the impact was enormous, right? Like their health index improved by a point or something. And if uh, a point improvement is like two digit millions of uh, in, basically increased uh, profit, right? It's huge. And so that's why there are these effects that are already proven through data that in general, these approaches work very well, but I think the approach on my side is upgrade a leadership team, better quality leaders. That's what we need these days. We need new leaders and the high performance mindset is just a, an approach, one approach that I've seen works very well, because if you have better, more conscious leader, then you get these ripple effects. I've seen that myself and I was experimenting even while I was still a leader here back in Germany, in Berlin, I worked at uh, Sandando, which is a large fashion yeah. e-commerce platform. I had a large team there, a large organization, about 400 people in there. And I applied these techniques, right? And I could definitely see that this huge impact if you do it properly, but there is no, unfortunately, of course, like a cookie cutter type of thing that you know, this is ABC and that it works. Well, <laughs> it's very, it's really individual based on the context. And, but that's why you use principles. And that's why I think in 2018 released so-called mindful leadership principles, and they have become very popular, widespread thousands of downloads where they basically on my blog to mindfulleader.net, where they look for these mindful leadership principles and they give guidance for leaders in terms of how to approach it. And this is what I've experienced then is uh, so impactful, but here comes the, but people read these leadership principles and it immediately resonates with them and they, they say, yeah, this makes sense. But the problem is they can't execute on them. Their level of present awareness, their LPA, this is the, for me, the most important KPI for measuring your state of awareness is usually so low 
that mm. you can't follow through with this stuff. You read like one of these principles here or be conscious yeah. of your thoughts, actions, and words, right? This is the first one where it basically means be present, right? But people can't be present because they, they try to be present. And then in the next moment, there is a thought coming up and then they get identified, connected to the thought. And then the thought triggers another thought and another thought. And they're basically daydreaming the whole day, right? So they can't be present. And that means without training, unfortunately, these principles look like a nice thing, but they can't follow through. And that was my experience. And that's why I figured there has to be a way to help them to to reach this heightened state of awareness, to upgrade the mind, because that is the condition first. You need this awareness to upgrade the mind. You need also this awareness to upgrade the body. And so how can that be done, right? And that's why this is when this whole program came about, then it was a gift, give them a, a tool like self-service where they can go in. Of course, they get all the support they need, but give them something where they can get it done in three months. And then they have a starting point and then they can iterate and they have all the tools at that point. They can continue their journey. Uh, but that approach so far, I've seen that works. And when working with uh, some of these uh, leaders that went through this, they achieve significant breakthroughs and they at some point then can execute all these mindful leadership principles. And it's super interesting because I was also listening to another interview you did after this, and I'm probably guilty of this myself as well, even though I'm trying to be aware, working with the mind and the body as well. It was very interesting at some point in that interview, you, you talk uh, about, you know, it's all good that you want to set yourself up to success with the right nutrition, the, the right exercise, all those things. But actually, if you're not in control of the mind in a way, then you can actually, you know, you can't change anything because the mind is such a strong state and actually it will not really settle the things in the right way. Yeah. Let's talk a bit more about that, Ryan, because I thought that was super, super insightful for myself because like lots of people spend lots of time on exercising, meditating maybe even, but they're not really in a conscious state when they do it. Yeah. I mean, that's the problem, right? I mean, there is this, people usually do random stuff, right? It's completely random. They try, they read something about meditation. Oh, there's meditation. And then they're curious and then they try it out and they can't sit still for a minute. And then they say, oh, this is not working for me. Right. So after one minute, they already get bored and they're, oh, no, this is, this is not good for me. They try other things, they go to the gym, they try workouts, they maybe try some fat loss programs, they <laughs> detoxification sure. programs, they, whatever they try, whether it's an intellectual thing or a thing more for the body, without proper awareness, it can't be done. It's just random stuff. And of course you can have luck. I'm not saying it's not working. I mean, this is how I did it. A lot of random stuff over the years. But I then switched more and more into the scientific mode because I, I, I needed to see what all of this, what all of these things are actually, what the impact is, right? And that's when I got into these KPIs. And so to, to transcend this randomness and ad hoc approach, I think KPIs and measurements is a good way to go. And there, there are people that works very well for them. They are like the data number guys, number persons. They are maybe in engineering, they might, might be in finance, whatever, but they know how to work with numbers. And for them, this works approach works very well. And then there's these others, they more, they like the more than woozy goosey type of approach, right? When, oh yeah, tracking is not for me. I can just feel that and that's good for me. I meditate, it's fine, right? Yeah, that could be fine. But the reality is, it's all random stuff. They, they may never reach any of these levels because if you don't, there is the saying, right? If you don't know the numbers, right? If you can't track it or measure it, you can't approve it. And so that is the thing, right? That the, this, Discipline using this type of tracking is widespread and the, the default state in the business world, right? If you would be a product manager of some technical product or whatever product it is, 
and your boss would ask you here, how's the product doing? What are the numbers? And then you would say something, oh, I don't need numbers. I can, I can feel it's going in the right direction, stuff, stuff like this. You would be fired, right? You would, you would yeah. say, well, show me the numbers. What are you talking about? Right? It's the same for the mind, awareness, and the body. Show me the numbers, right? That's that's where the thing kicks in. And that's why when people tell me that, oh, yeah, they're in good state, they meditate, they feel healthy, and say, well, that's what you think, but you have no proof for it, right? Show me the, show me the data. Mm-hmm. And, they, and they can't, right? So they can't show me the data. And that is fine. I mean, it's everyone can do whatever they want, but if you really want to get into a state of a high-performance mindset, meaning having really increased level of awareness, having this type of upgraded mind software and having an upgraded body, you need data to get you there. Later on, we can talk about, maybe you don't need what I mentioned earlier, you don't maybe not need all of the data anymore and make it practical, easy on you. And you get all these benefits, but to get you there, this is basically an approach, getting from random to really more targeted structured focus way of getting there and this is how you can get it done in quick time right in, that's why i said three months four months is definitely reasonable some people they make of course progress much faster usually i see breakthroughs within a few weeks um, but that is usually good guidance and then other people's the ones usually that do the random stuff they may take them 10 years right like myself of course i got very quickly in, into the data uh, triple mode they may also reach something by luck, and that is fine as well. Or there are other people, they just wake up and they have an enlightened state of mind, right? You know, also read about that, that is also possible. But this is like the exception. I don't know if it's one in a million or, or even worse, right? So you may be lucky that you wake up in the morning and you're in this enlightened state of mind, the awareness is fully ramped up. But usually that's not the case. Usually you need to figure out there is work involved, there is training involved, and whatever it is, you have to do some work to get there. And I guess like that's really to transfer what I was sitting and thinking about as you we were talking, it's a bit like athletes that's going for the Olympics or the World Cup or want to win Tour de France for that say, they have lots of measurement and have very incremental focusing on how to improve themselves, but they actually have a program for it. Mm-hmm. It's not a random thing that's happening and suddenly they win the world cup. They have had yeah. like a system that's definitely taken them up to the top of the pyramid. And then there's, there's an amount of block sometimes to be get number one or win, but the, they only could able to take them up to that 1% where, or the 1% is by doing actually. And that's good. And I thought that was really, really interesting, but I think actually often we are too random in many things we do as leaders, we actually don't take that approach that actually we need to be systematic about it. If it's not like the accounts or the, the P and L. And I think here the impact it can have, I think is really strong. So that made me really reflect on how I did things myself, you know, it's great in setting out all these great goals, ambitions, but then your approach to get yourself in the best possible state to achieve them. You maybe have a random approach or you maybe have some things you do every day, you go running, mm-hmm. but it's not really thought about it's going to work in another another thing i wanted to touch on Ryan, before we stop as well is like you talked about biohacking as well and you know i've been looking a lot into like what medicinal mushrooms can do i put it in my coffee every day and i take different things is that one of the tools as well i guess there's a number of tools there's meditations that you talked about a couple of different things there's different tools and you need to find out what toolbox that really elevate you, I guess, the answers as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there are different toolboxes for each compartment. There's toolboxes for awareness, usually mm-hmm. supported by mindfulness exercises, breathing, meditation, and so on. There's toolboxes for the mind, which is rooted in neuroscience. There's so many different approaches there to replace limiting thought patterns, basically reprogram reactive patterns and so on. So there's all this good stuff is there. It's called mind management. And then on the biohacking side is rooted in deeply into the science of epigenetics and functional medicine. 
So it really, and this is the whole problem for all these three things. There is a lot of learning that you have to do. I mean, you, you may yeah. do some random stuff, but you have no clue how this all affects each of these aspects. Let's say the body, the different systems in the body. You have to become aware. What are all those systems in the body that need your support? How do I know they're working? Then we go into your DNA, right? We're looking at the building block of what you're made of because everything needs to be personalized. You can't just pop in some pills and then hope it works. You have to know, do I even need these pills? Let's say mm. suppl supplements, right? Is that helping? Or the mushrooms, do they help me? I mean, there's so many types of different medical mushrooms. I like them uh, myself and there is also a lot of science behind them, but you also have to know which mushrooms for what purpose and what, what is the dosage, what is the best product here that makes sense how to integrate all that stuff. So you need to know at the end to make it fully personalized, how is your body built? So you have to understand how on a cellular level and from a system perspective, your body works. So that means sophisticated, detailed blood analysis, which is usually the case when you go into the functional medicine space. So you have to know then what biomarker you have to basically look at. And then there is an intervention if they're not in a, in a good range, how to optimize them. I pick an example, vitamin D. This is so impactful from a scientific standpoint. Uh, in the last 10, 20 years, more and more data has emerged on the vitamin D importance to regulate your gene expressions. Mm. And, and if people don't even realize this, right, it's sometimes not even on the radar. Maybe the doctor looks at it and says, oh yeah, this is a value looks okay. But the reality is this is a very poor value. And mm. the impact is when you think about epigenetics as the software that drives your genes, then vitamin D is the key to unlock that, right? So that means with a poor vitamin D level, your basically body is able to regulate up to 50 gene expressions. That's it. But with a really good, strong, optimal therapeutic level of vitamin D, your body can regulate more than 2000 gene expressions. So go from 50 to 2000. This is a, this is a game changer, right? In terms of how well your body runs as an oiled machine, right? If yeah. you can only regulate 50 of these gene expressions and the rest you can't regulate, then you're in trouble, right? Because yeah. why, why is this important? Well, there could be some, some genes that are basically tumor suppressing genes. And those you want to have turned on, you want lots, you want to have lots of building blocks in this, uh, in this space of treating, uh, basically hindering these cancer cells to spread in your body, right? This is a good example and swell it. And so vitamin D is the key to unlock this, but most people, they, they have no clue about it. How do you even measure it? It's not that trivial. It's complex. You need usually a functional medicine doctor who is really familiar with this to even do a, a solid analysis, what your current state is. And then based on that state, you have to have a personalized approach of getting these values in good shape. And vitamin D is just one piece in the puzzle. There is. 20, 30, 40, 50 of these different things that you have to bring in order to get your body in good shape. And so I studied, as I said, many, many years in these, I got deep into epigenetics, functional medicine and so on. And as a scientist, this is like a playground because then I, I, I realized, oh man, this is even cooler than like writing software systems in the business world. Here I'm actually writing the software for my genes, for my body, right? Which is... Yeah. Epi through epigenetics, but you also have to understand how the body works. This is the DNA level. We do a DNA analysis. You look at, let's say, the 60 most important genes. They affect different systems. And then you have a good clue how that body is working. And then you can use the blood work to validate that, oh, yeah, this is indeed like this. Here we have to do a little bit of upregulation, downregulation, stabilization, optimization. So it's the, the genes, it's not like in these old days that people say, oh, there is this gene and now I get cancer or whatever. No, that's not the case. The, the idea is there is multiple genes and they're basically influencing this productivity and the overall state of the systems that are running into my, in, in my body. Like let's say detoxification is one, right? And 
they affect the quality of the detoxification as an example. And so then I need to know what can I do now to change the software so that they work well, right? And that is, that is a cool thing. And this is what biohacking is all about to work with all kinds of different interventions, fasting, sleep optimization, sports, exercises, breathing, supplements, light therapy, whatever. There's so many cool things you can do. And, uh, but I mean, they work very well. That's what I did. I upgraded my body in the past five to six years, roughly and got all these markers in really good shape. I even decreased my biological age by 10 years, which is cool. So I, that's even good. That, wow. See, this is, this is when you get results, right? So uh, now I'm in the mid fifties. I'm basically in the biological side of the mid forties. And this was a measurement I did last year. Of course, I did now more things this year and I'll do another measurements in a few months. I'm probably, uh, my hope is I'm getting back, back to the early forties as the next steps, so 15 years uh, cut off. From the, from the age. And that is all this area of longevity, which is really cool. But you know what you, you have to basically know what you're doing. You have to work with some experts in the fields. It's otherwise not going to work, but going back to this, you need this high level of awareness. Otherwise it's not going to work. You mm -hmm. can't basically, you see people going on these fancy diets or, or whatever new fancy program. They do it a little bit and then they basically get stuck and then they get out and that's it. This is a problem with awareness. So first, that's why I always said awareness is the root foundation of everything. And then when awareness goes up, then you work on some biohacking. And of course, there is a lot of information to absorb and learnings and you need certain expertise. You need to work with experts in that field. But before you even do that, you upgrade awareness. Then you upgrade the mind and then you work with the body, right? And at some point, of course, it becomes more parallel execution. Yeah. But this is the order that I found in my experience makes a lot of sense. Well, that was really helpful because that was one of the things that we just have to bring it up in the, the big picture where it actually starts and this actually starts with the awareness. And most people would think, oh, well, we love the body bit first because you know you just said i want to go on a diet i want to hack myself but actually we need to start in the other end to get significant yeah. results in the other end i thought that, that was really really helpful as well and that was one of the things that really made me reflect on some things as well as i was preparing for this a last question reiner what top advice would you give to to leaders out there they are, they are trying to build a business as a force for good yeah, I, I, I definitely, if you have listened now to this episode and some of the topics are resonating with you, I think start exploring and basically the whole area of boosting your level of present awareness. And there's simple ways to do this. I think learning how to first establish a baseline on your level of present awareness, your LPA. This is where I would start with, right? To learn how can I, how can I step a baseline, I step a baseline so that I know how aware am I? And that can be done. That can be learned. It's not so difficult and you can learn it. You can start tracking it so that you know where you are, right? And then you can pick whatever mindfulness program, breathing exercises, meditation, yoga, whatever, and apply that for a few weeks and keep measuring. See what happens to your LPA, right? And so that's why I, I think th this is how to get started is learn how to track your LPA. There's articles on my blog, The Mindful Leader, Leader where you can read about it. There's videos there. I mean, it's, it's learnable, doable. Of course, I have the, I mentioned the training and all that stuff is available as well for those who want to really go deeper. But I think this is how I would start. And then you start after that, you will basically learn about mind KPIs, you learn about body KPIs, not all of them, but just a few. And then you basically work your way through to not get overwhelmed. But over time, this becomes a new lifestyle. And this is the high performance mindset lifestyle. It's that is what it actually is. It's a lifestyle mm. and it evolves. It's never done. <laughs> You're never done with any of this, right? But you now have to, in this lifestyle, 
you have a framework that you, that can guide you. Is it helpful for me or not? You look at the KPIs and then you can quickly tell it's working or not, right? And this is where you get to. And then, and then of course, while your awareness is increasing, then start to look on the application level. Are you a business leader, tech leader? Are you an engineer? Are you an individual contributor? How can you use now these new capabilities and qualities to make a positive impact at work or broader here on this planet, right? Think about all this stuff is interesting, but what good is it for if you don't create some value that can be basically shared and can actually impact other people's lives? So I think this is the most important thing. So not, very, just op right? not optimize yourself just for the sake of optimization. That's, in my opinion, not that interesting. I think you have to now use these new capabilities and make a dent here to impact something positive on this planet. Right? Yeah, and that comes very much to the, the reflection I just had. It's about, you know, you can't lead others before you can lead yourself or you can't impact other things positively if you can't impact yeah. yourself positively. That, that's really good. Rainer, right where where can people connect with you? We'll of course put the the website in the the show notes as you have the blog and all the the good advice. Where where can people connect with you if they want to learn more, if they want to explore mindful leadership? Yeah, no, definitely go to the mindfulleader.net. Link will be there. I'm on all social media channels, LinkedIn, whatever. I right? saw so YouTube. There's links on there in all those different things. I mentioned the blog, I mentioned the high performance web program, but the mindfulleader.net is a good starting point. And then definitely if you have questions, reach out to me. I'm always responsive when it comes to inquiries. Great, great. Thank you so much for, for, for coming on the show, Ryan. Send your power and energy of making the world and leaders a bit more mindful. Yeah, thanks, Michael, for having me today.